Hello, everyone. Welcome to All Things Legal. Now, since this is the first episode, I thought it best to do an introduction of who I am and also what to expect of this program in its forthcoming weeks. My name is Janine Lang, and I have been an attorney at law for over 10 years. I love reading about the law and I enjoy the practice of the law. And I thought that it would be useful to share with you about all things legal. Every week, I will be looking at one legal topic which affects the Jamaican legal landscape. I will also be reviewing some topical legal news items which appear in our local news. I will also be using topics which are suggested by you and I hope to answer any questions which you may have about specific scenarios. There will be no limit to the gamut of legal issues which we will explore. And where I am not seized of the information, I will invite resource persons to share with you further. This program, however, is not meant to substitute or replace legal advice from an attorney at law. And you should still consult your attorney at law if you have legal issues, even if the facts are similar to those discussed on this program. Thank you for listening. Welcome. And I look forward to sharing with you in the coming weeks. Now, the first, prog the first segment of the program, we'll be looking at two specific news items. What's in the news? Now, the Gleaner reports today, February 7th, 2020, that there is a joint select committee currently deliberating on passing a sexual harassment bill. The newspaper writes that, Justice Minister Delroy Chuck yesterday urged Gender Minister Olivia Grange to roll out a public education exercise ahead of the proposed passage of the sexual harassment bill in a bid to use moral suasion to discourage miscreants from targeting women. Justice Minister Chuck said that Jamaican women were going through hell in taxes and elsewhere, noting that the ministry with responsibility for gender affairs should produce jingles for radio and television to educate our awful men that they need to treat our women better. However, Kerencia Morrison, a fellow government senator, said it was important to strike a balance on the issue of sexual harassment, sharing that men too have stories about women who hound them for sex on the job. She said, many times in this discussion, you have women who come across as the victims and they may very well be. But let us not forget that we also have a culture that tells our boys and our men that they can't complain about something like this. Otherwise, you are less than a man. Morrison also supported the call for a public education program to sensitize society on acceptable behavior. She said, the lines are blurred because there have been times when I feel so good when I walk on the road and depends on what some of these same guys say. You know, maybe I puff my chest out and I actually feel good and I feel hot. Maybe at that time I was probably beautifully harassed. Now, Olivia Grange, who also shares, chairs the Joint Select Committee, said that her ministry was aware of the need to strike a balance. Our women are at a great disadvantage, but we also have to ensure that our men are protected, she said. Now, in an interview with Grange at the end of the committee meeting, the Gender Affairs Minister said that the proposed law was intended to protect both men and women from sexual harassment. Let me hear from you. What do you think, listeners? How far should this proposed bill go? Should cat calls and that distinctive Jamaican sound that our men make be classified as sexual harassment? Do Jamaican men go too far in soliciting women on the streets of Jamaica? Is more protection needed for women? Is more protection needed for men? What exactly constitutes sexual harassment? What do you think? Let me hear from you. You can call our local number, 876-453-1444, or 
or our international number is 954-338-7973. So you can call these in-studio numbers so that we can have a chat about this particular proposed sexual harassment bill. Let me hear from you. Now, another item in the news concerns the recent amendment to the Road Traffic Act. As of January 24th, 2020, an applicant for a learner's license will now be required to pass a road code test in order to receive a learner's permit. This requirement is part of the provisions under the new Road Traffic Act passed in the Houses of Parliament in 2018. The objective is to ensure that persons are better equipped to use the road while they are learning to drive. Now, this came into effect on the 24th of last month, and the Tax Administration Office reported that applications jumped from 500 per day to 5,000, with the constant spring, crossroads, downtown Kingston, Spanish Town, and Montego Bay offices accounting for the majority of the transactions. Now, some persons argued that this was a sign of young people not wishing to comply with the new amendment to the Road Traffic Act and speaks to their intention to obtain their licenses by illegal means. In other words, they plan to buy the license and not drive for it. But others say it was simply an attempt to avoid the bureaucracy of having to visit two government offices to apply for a learner's permit. What do you think, listeners? What do you think about this proposed amendment which now requires applicants for the provisional driver's license to pass the road code test before they are given their learner's license? Is this a well-needed amendment to our Road Traffic Act? Now, the main change to the act, as I said before, is that persons wishing to obtain the learner's license to drive or, or to operate a motor vehicle, including a motorcycle, they now have to first go to any of the island traffic authority examination depots to do the multiple choice road code test. The act now provides in section 23 that the authority meaning the Island Traffic Authority may grant to an applicant a learner's permit if satisfied that the applicant is one, at least 17 years of age, has successfully completed the prescribed road code test, and has paid the prescribed fee. Last year, the government reports that at least 400 persons lost their lives in traffic accidents across the island. Now, previously, applicants were required to take the road code test at the time when they were applying for the actual license. But now, even before applying for the actual license, a learner must understand the provisions of the road code. Now, listeners, I want to hear some feedback from you concerning this. Do you agree with this amendment to the Road Traffic Act? What do you say is the value to this new requirement? Should provisional license applicants be required to know the road code before being granted their learners? Do you think that this will assist in curbing the number of accidents on our Jamaican roads? Have you ever been on the road and, you know, somebody bad drive you and an idea or a thought comes into your head that this person is not familiar with the road code, whether it is failure to obey a, a, a traffic signal or a, a sign that's on the road, or a, a failure to, to, to abide by proper overtaking practices in terms of the unbroken white line. Mm? Let me hear from you. What are your thoughts on these proposed, these, these actual amendments, proposed amendments in relation to the sexual harassment bill and in relation to the amendment to the Road Traffic Act? What says you? Do you believe that there is actually a, a, a gap in our law that was, 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 was clarified and made clear by this amendment to the Road Traffic Act? And do you think that we need to have a proper sexual harassment law addressing sexual harassment issues in this country, not just for women, but for men as well? Let me hear from you.
Again, you can call our in-studio numbers or local numbers 876-453-1444 or you can call our international number 954-338-7973. Is there a WhatsApp um, number that's also available? The same number, the 876-453-1444. The, the you can WhatsApp in your comments or your questions concerning, um, concerning these, these um, particular news items. Now, while you marinate on this subject area, there was a recent interesting judgment in our Supreme Court in January 2020. Now, this judgment came at a time when Kingston has been seeing a significant increase in high-rise developments across the corporate area. And because of this, it was the subject of the highest interest to readers who learned of the decision. I mean, as recently as about a week and a half ago, there was a a town centre meeting concerning the high-rise developments in Kingston, concerning whether or not they had obtained the proper approvals, whether the, the, the developments were going up too fast, too high, too soon. Now, let me quickly share a breakdown of the background facts of this particular case. This case concerned Land, which is part of Vale Royal in St. Andrew, which was to amend certain restrictive covenants, and it concerned Sarah Chin, Jen Shea, Marvin Gordon Hall, Henderson Emmanuel Downer, Marcus Handal, Una Pearl Whittle, Brenda Rose Francis, and against Martin Lynn, Melissa Elizabeth Lynn, and Martin Maxwell Lynn. Now, let me give you a brief breakdown of the background facts to this case. In April 2017, Martin Lynn and his two children, Martin, Matthew Lynn, and Elizabeth Lynn, became joint owners of property located at 18 Upper Montrose Road, Kingston 6 in St. Andrew. Now, their title had several restrictive covenants numbered 2, 4, and 5, which restricted the use of the land to single residences. These covenants read as follows. Not to subdivide the said land except in accordance with the aforesaid plan or in accordance with a plan approved by the board under Chapter 26 of the Revised Laws, in which latter case none of the lots shall be less than half an acre in area. So there was a restriction on subdivision. There was a further restriction in Restrictive Covenant 4 that said only one residence shall be erected on any lot of the said land. Such residence together with the buildings appurtenant to shall cost not less than 800 pounds and shall be filled with proper sewer installation and no pit closet shall be erected for use on the said land. Restrictive Covenant 5 said, No building shall be erected within 30 feet of any road and 10 feet of any other boundary. So these restrictive covenants concerned how the land was supposed to be used. There was a restriction on subdivision, except where it was in accordance with the plan. There was a restriction on a, to single-family residence. And then there was a restriction on the, 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 the area and the length of the set, setback from whatever building to the main road. Now, these are the modifications which the Lynn sought. The land above described shall not be subdivided except into lots for the erection of townhouses and apartments in accordance with the statutory approvals. Four, no building other than townhouses and or apartments with the necessary outbuildings appurtenant thereto shall be erected on the said land and such buildings shall be used for no other purpose other than for private residential use. The fifth and final covenant which they sought to modify was in these terms. No townhouse and or apartments 
house to be erected on the said land shall be erected at a distance of less than 20 feet from any road boundary thereof and eight feet of any other boundary save and except that this shall not apply to the guard room, swimming pool, gazebo, and garbage receptacle. Now, on April 5th, 2017, the KSAC or the Kingston and St. Andrew Corporation approved a building application from the Linz to construct a multiple residential complex, including two two bedroom townhouses and four one bedroom apartments. The approval was subject to the following conditions. I want you to listen closely to these conditions. This approval does not dispense with the obligation to apply for modification or discharge of any restrictive covenants where the approval is not in conformity with any covenants endorsed on the title and is subject to such modification or discharge as the case may be. It further said that the failure to comply with the conditions as listed above and the approved plans will be considered what? A breach and will render the approval null and void. Just on a first reading, a surface reading of these sections of the approval, it becomes immediately clear that the building approval was not absolute and it could be revoked if these conditions were not met. The KCC said if the conditions were not met, then their approval, the approval of the KCC, would be null and void. Now, this radio station is based in Port Antonio. And in Port Antonio, we have our own parish council, which is now known as the Portland Municipal Corporation. And approvals of this nature, which are conditional, are not unusual across the, 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 the various municipal corporations in the country. We have approvals which are premised on conditions of this nature. So if you are applying for a building approval, you have a building plan and you want to build your house and you get a conditional approval, you need to look at the conditions because you can't start to build until you have met the conditions. So you have gotten an approval, but before you get to the approval, you have to fulfill the conditions of the parish council. Now... Faced with an approval like that, what would you do? Because the KSAC said that the lanes were supposed to apply for modification or discharge of their restrictive covenants. Well, here is what happened with the lanes. In September 2017, the lanes applied to the Supreme Court to modify or discharge the covenants restricting the use of their land to single family residences. The court then ordered that they serve notice to the adjoining owners, including the claimant, Sarah Chin Jen Shea, and her husband, Marvin Gordon Hall, and the other neighbors. And this was done in February 27, 2018. The court said that any objections to the modification application should be made within 14 days. Within the window, the 14-day window, Mrs. She Sarah Chin Jen Shea filed objection on March 7, 2018. Now, while the application was pending, would you imagine what the Lins did? They commenced construction in August 2017. Now, you will remember that they only applied to modify the restrictive covenants in September. So before they even made the application to the Supreme Court, they had already started building after they got the conditional approval from the KSAC in April 2017. The claimant, being Mrs. Sarah Chin Jen Shea, wrote a cease and desist letter on May 16, 2018, that all construction should stop until the modification application before the Supreme Court was resolved. Instead, the Lins continued their construction. So, Mrs. Chin Jen Shea, as well as five other members of, upper, of the Upper Montrose Road community, where the land was situated, on October 5, 2018, filed suit against the Lins, opposing the application for modification of the covenants and sought an injunction restraining continuing construction. In December 2018, they obtained an injunction. This injunction also forbade the Lins 
to have anyone occupy the development while the injunction was continuing. And this injunction was later extended as well until the completion of the matters before the court. Now, what do you think happened? The Lins were faced with a conditional approval from the local KCC. They had sight of an objection from their neighbors. Their neighbors went further to file to serve them with a cease and desist letter. And then they also obtained injunctions to stop them from continuing construction on the building. But the Lins completed the full building. And after they had completed the full building, they hired a realtor to advertise the development for rental and the property was fully tenanted by the time that the matter came before the judge who made this decision in January of, la in January of this year. Now, this particular judgment has been making its rounds on social media. And quite a number of persons were very upset to know that a developer would have spent over a hundred million dollars on a development, beautiful development. The Gleaner obtained aerial shots, this light blue colored um, townhouse complex with, with, with its apartments. It looked very attractive with a pool, swimming pool at the, at the front, very beautiful. Many people would like to live there. Many people would consider that to be a very, very worthwhile and useful investment. Maybe, you know, Mr. Lin was thinking that this would be a, the legacy for his children, you know, because his children were joint owners, you know, um, of the title. But Justice Judith Pusey was not pleased. She considered that Mr. Lin had flouted the laws of this country he had no respect for the uh, conditions which were imposed by the KSAC. Neither did he have any regard to the court with the fact that the application for the modification of the restrictive covenant was still pending. And he further had no respect for the, to the court because there were injunctions against him continuing um, construction as well as having the place tenanted. Mr. Lin even went further. You will recall that what he got um, approval for from the parish council was actually... I'm, I'm seeing your question here, Karen. I, so apart from the, 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 um, the injunction and all of those things, Mr. Lin only had approval for a two bedroom, two, two bedroom townhouses. And Mr. Lin clo enclosed one of the studios in the, one of the townhouses and created a third, a third bedroom. So he was also in breach of the approval which was granted by the parish council. I see your question there, Karen Montague. Good evening. But if you can drive, you still have to pay to get the license. Good evening. But if you can drive, you still have to pay to get the license. Yes. Um, you, if, even if you can drive, I mean, I'm sorry? What type of what? Payment. Oh, um, you, oh, in terms of the learner's license, I believe it is $1,800 that the tax office charges for the learner's license. And yes, a lot of us are good drivers, but even if we can drive, we still have to satisfy the examiner that we are familiar with the, 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 the road. You know, we understand what side of the road we're supposed to be driving. We understand the, the, the various tra traffic um, signs. You know, so you still have to drive. And that's a part of the requirement under the Road Traffic Act. I see Karen typing. Karen perhaps has another question again. Now, I think a lot of um, persons, because, you know, it is, it is well known even though these are allegations because we, we can't say for a fact, but 
these are popular allegations that quite a number of persons buy their licenses in, in, in Jamaica, you know, and s there are some, some of us in some quarters who believe that this is what accounts for a lot of the bad driving in Jamaica, that or drivers or motorists, you know, they did not go through the rigors of applying for their license to familiarize themselves with the road code to go through the, the road test you know and um, this is the reason why we have so many incidents you know so many traffic incidents the government was trying to keep the, the road fatalities under 300 and last year we 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 we, we, we failed miserably miserably oh you mean the general license uh, monique karen yes indeed you have to pay you have to pay to get the actual license, but the $1,800 is to get the provisional license. We're going to have to take a break now, and we'll come back and um, continue our discussions. Join your host, Janine Lang, on Styles FM this and every Friday from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. for all things legal. We'll be looking at everyday matters and their legal implications. All things being equal, stay tuned with Janine Lang as she presents to you All Things Legal on Styles FM, Fridays, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Zane's Pharmacy is now open at shop number 8, Presa Plaza, Morant Bay. We're here to satisfy all your pharmaceutical needs and more. Currently, we do free blood pressure checks and blood sugar testing, as well as HIV testing and counseling. Zane's Pharmacy, open Mondays to Saturdays, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., and on Sundays for your convenience from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Telephone 876-779-0006 or WhatsApp your prescriptions to 876-855-6291. That's Zane's Pharmacy, now open at shop number 8, Presa Plaza, Morant Bay. Thank God it's Friday, the new day for real talk. So join Daddy Rude and Lady Cleo on a Friday night, 9 to 12, for real talk. The show where we discuss all that's real and nothing ideal, only on Styles FM. Don't miss the adrenaline rush with the musical ingenious Digital T. Saturdays, right here on Styles FM from 4 to 8 p.m. Remember the uprising artists and new music segment from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Also, mix journal hour from 6 to 7 p.m. And the party hour from 7 to 8 p.m. Come, Styles FM. <laughs> Digital T. Our brain. Uh -huh. Do you have or are you seeking a place to rent? Seeking employment or have a job vacancy? Are you selling a car or having a garage sale? Then come see us. Let Styles do the advertising for you and you'll be on your way in no time. Contact us at 876-286-9216 or 439-5160. Advertising Style. Advertise with Styles. Join your host, Janine Lang, on Styles FM this and every Friday from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. for all things legal. We'll be looking at everyday matters and their legal implications. All things being equal, stay tuned with Janine Lang as she presents to you all things legal on Styles FM Fridays, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Planning a party? Club night out? stage show, a gospel concert, or even a business sales event, let Styles FM be a part of your promoting tool. Take advantage of our low price promotion packages with commercials, interviews, giveaways, reviews, and much more. We have special offers when you mix and match and bundle your options. Contact us at 876-286-9216 or 439-5160. Styles FM for the most effective way to exploit your marketing dollar. Wednesday estimated here with 170 miles per hour. Get ready for catch that weekend party vibe. It's Friday Storm with Friday DJ Storm Mookie. With it's not just radio. It's all genres of music. It's dancehall, pop, dance reggae, hall. electronic, hip-hop, Afrobeat, soca, new school, old school, you name it. Every Friday, 5.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. It's a party with DJ Mookie. It's a party. Hey. Let's get together. 
Join your host, Janine Lang, on Styles FM this and every Friday from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. for all things legal. We'll be looking at everyday matters and their legal implications. All things being equal, stay tuned with Janine Lang as she presents to you all things legal on Styles FM. Fridays, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Welcome back. Welcome back to All Things Legal with Janine Lang, attorney at law. Thank you for to all the listeners who have tuned in to the program, and I really appreciate the feedback that I have been getting so far. Now, you know, um, I see another comment here where... Um, I probably shouldn't say her name given what she has typed, but she says, you know, you have to buy it because they will fail you when you drive for it continuously until you give them a certain amount of money. They then pass you and give you the license. I understand that it can be very frustrating, listeners, you know, um, when you are, you are failed for what you might consider to be, you know, minor mistakes in applying for your road license but you have to also appreciate that the the examiner you know he has certain you know expectations of what a driver is expected to be able to do you know and while there might be some corruption if you are indeed a good driver i believe that you will prevail there are lots of honest law-abiding Jamaicans who have actually dutifully and lawfully um, applied for their driver's license. They went and they did their road code test and they passed their road code test and they drove for their license, parallel park and everything. And they got their, their driver's license. And what we don't want to encourage with the buying of the license as well is that while there might be persons who might not want to have to deal with the bureaucracy, but there are actually persons too who, who cannot drive at all. There are persons, some persons who are driving who are not even literate. I saw recently where a councillor, I can't remember from what parish, it might have been St. Catherine, where he was saying that the government might need to revise the requirement for the drivers to be literate. Um, because most of the, the road traffic um, signs now, um, they are established signs that everybody can read. But literacy is very important in, in terms of understanding as well. You know, um, so, you know, the government wants to sift out, you know, unlawful drivers, rogue drivers, you know, um, so that is the reason that they have these precautions and these checks and balances so that our roads are safer. And safer roads benefits all of us. You know, um, there are times there are some persons who have actually met in accidents through no fault of their own because of rogue drivers. So we want to keep that to the minimum. I had another question um, concerning the... The, the particular judgment that came out of the Supreme Court last month, um, it, you know, it was asked concerning the restrictive covenant. If, if the restrictive covenant, that means that you can only build, you know, one house on, on the property. Now, what I want to say is that in explaining what restrictive covenants are, restrictive covenants will differ based on the title. So the idea of restrictive covenants is that land in Jamaica is zoned for particular purposes. So we're currently in Bonebrook, and perhaps Bonebrook started out as strictly residential, but it is now a mixed development. So it is both residential and commercial, which is why Styles FM has its headquarters in Boundbrook. But people also live in Boundbrook, right? So there might be a restrictive covenant that on uh, it might have started that way, that the properties in Boundbrook were limited and restricted to residential developments only. But with the passage of time, the character of the community changed so that the restrictive covenants had to be modified to reflect development and sometimes that's what happens 
You have even in certain areas in Jamaica where certain lands are zoned for agricultural purposes. But a lot of persons love the country too. So they might decide that they don't just want the land to plant up cocoa, yam, banana, and all different kind of ag agricultural produce, but they want to live there. So they can also modify that restrictive covenant to reflect their particular need. You know, um, in some, some developments, for example, there are some restrictive covenants which are very detailed that you can't open the gate um, outwards. You have to open it inwards. There are some restrictive covenants that you can't hang laundry so that it is visible from the roadside because people don't want them place to look you know, look a particular way. There's an expression that I have in mind, but I don't know if it is radio friendly. But you, 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 you can visualize what I am talking about in terms of, you know, people want to, to maintain that kind of um, image for certain neighborhoods. So restrictive covenants will differ based on the particular neighborhood. So this particular neighborhood was known Upper Montrose Road. It's very close to Vale Royal. It's an upper class community. And it was known um, to have single-family dwellings, single-family residences. And over time, even though the surrounding communities had changed, because I noticed some of the comments that persons had, on, for example, on the Gleaners' um, Instagram page, that they were saying, but how come we're seeing so many... Um, townhouses and apartment complexes in the surrounding regions, right? But what the court actually found was that Upper Montrose Road was a community within a community. And the lots were so large that the owners of these lots and the setback, meaning the, the, the place, um, the distance between the road and the building was such that, you know, um, the residents um, expected a certain kind of lifestyle. The reason that it was intended to be single family dwellings as well is that the owners didn't really want persons. One of the problems that the claimant in this case, she didn't want persons in these high rise to be looking over into her yard. So can I sit through our window? You know, these are these are real real things. And you know what really struck me particularly about this case you know, um, because a lot of persons I found were, were siding with the developer. But what I found interesting is that in this particular case, the judge herself visited the locus. Locus is Latin for location. She went and she looked at the location herself. And she could see the kind of family dwellings which were there. So she didn't just take the word of the parties for it. You know, there are times when there are disputes before the court and lawyers might my feel that the court would benefit if the judge would visit, physically visit the location to have a true picture of what is really taking place on the ground. And that is what happened in that particular case. Justice Pusey dutifully took the, the drive up to Upper Montrose Road and she looked at the location herself. And she was satisfied having considered everything the totality of everything, what everyone was saying, that these people were entitled to these restrictive covenants when they buy the property, at least they expect forget. Right? And in, the, in those circumstances, the court was not minded to modify the restrictive covenant to allow Mr. Lin to build his townhouse complex. And finally, the court decided that Mr. Lin was required to demolish this structure where he had invested over a hundred million dollars. That's not chicken feed people. Over a hundred million dollars into this development. He had to demolish whether it is the entire structure or parts of the structure because the court also invited the parties to make submissions to say how, how best can we arrive at a situation where parts of the building is demolished so that it can comply with the restrictive covenant. So maybe not ev all of the building needed to be demolished, but certain sections because a single family dwelling. So 
the building should not be made to accommodate this multiple family dwelling. Now, of course, when a man has made such a huge investment in property or anything else, it is unlikely that he, he will be willing to accept such a loss just like that. So there's also a possibility, I don't know, I will keep you updated, that he might be appealing this ruling as well. So he might take it to the Court of Appeal. And it remains to be seen whether or not the Court of Appeal will form the same conclusions as the trial judge in the Supreme Court formed. But I also don't want you to view this case in a vacuum because you have to remember that Mr. Mr. Lin, he had several oppositions in this particular matter. You know, the objections were filed by his neighbors. He started building before he had actually... Okay, I'm seeing a question coming in. I'm, I'm going to get to that question soon. There were injunctions against the, um, the property, and he went ahead despite all of that. You know, um, I'm going to continue after I've looked at this question. Um, one of our listeners said, said, isn't the developer at a disadvantage when the approval is granted by the municipal corporation with provisional conditions? No, that is in fact a very legitimate point. And, um, you know, some critics have said that the way that the parish council and perhaps the whole process in applying for the, the discharge or the modification of the restrictive covenant operates. It's, it's, it's in a very disjointed way that they should operate in a, you know, because um, some persons might not understand in reading um, an approval that it is conditional and that they are required to meet certain conditions, perhaps a per procedure. So having spoken to a senior superintendent at one of our municipal corporations, he had indicated to me that perhaps the best way to deal with these conditional kinds of approval, approvals is for the municipal corporation to first invite and instruct the developer to seek the discharge and modification from the court first and after securing that, that discharge or modification, then they can apply for the building approval. So that is possibly something that the, the parish councils, um, ha after having, deal de dealing, um, having dealt with, with such a terrible um, situation like this, where you know, it's so final that he has you know, expended so much money on this development that perhaps the better model would have been for the person to start with the Supreme Court first and then go to the parish council to seek the building approval. Some, some may say um, it is a case of putting the, 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 the cart before the horse, you know? No, but that's it. Um, the parish council can approve, but the parish council is a building approval. But what it is, is that there is still a restriction on the title saying that you can't build in a particular way. So you've gotten something, but the title takes, takes it away with the next hand. You, somebody give you something with one hand and take it back with the next hand. So that is why the person or listener is asking if the developer is at a disadvantage when the approval is granted, you know, um, and the discharge or the modification of that particular covenant has not been effected by the, the, the Supreme Court. And in fact, this is part of the argument that Mr. Lin had used in the case when he was saying that, you know, he thought that the, the approval was, was a matter of course, that he was going to absolutely get the approval. Why wouldn't he get the, 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 the go-ahead to do so from the Supreme Court? So he really thought that he would have gotten it. But the court also found that Mr. Lin in this particular case was not a... Uh, was a bit disingenuous. You know, she, she used the, the maxim. She says he, he, he's coming now to ask the court to grant him a little equity. And there is an expression in law that says... 
he who comes to equity must come with clean hands. And they were saying that Mr. The judge was saying Mr. Lin does not have clean hands because Mr. Lin had several oppositions and restrictions against him. He knew about it. And Mr. Lin was not an ordinary civilian. Mr. Lin was an architect. So he should have known better. He should have known better, and he did know better because there was a previous case involving, um, there's a Sajikor case where the court had actually found um, in that particular case that that same community of Upper Montrose Road, they were not in entitled to build multiple family dwellings. And Mr. Lin was the architect in that case. So he knew the position and the, the direction that the court would be minded to go in view you know, of a previous decision of which he was a part. So he didn't get into this case from an ignorant perspective. He, he knew exactly what he was doing. And the court kind of was of the view that Mr. Mr. Lin was trying to hold the court at ransom to say, see, me spend a whole heap of money. You can't tell me if I mash down my place, you better you find me. Because that's actually the argument that his lawyer used to say, you know, oh, I'll slap him with a fine. Let me fine him. But he was in for the shock of his life when the court said, no, uh, the fine is not sufficient. The building must go down. You know, there is an expression that says, what goes up must come down. And that really was what happened in this particular case. Mr. Lin put up that building really, really quickly, but it had to come down. And it was really because of his attitude, his attitude towards the particular agencies which were involved, you know, in this, in this matter. Now, I want to ask you some questions that I want you to bear in mind. These are some of the issues arising from the judgment. Now, having received a building approval from your parish council, you want to build a house, all of us, you know, a home. Home is where the heart is, they say. You want to build a home. You get an approval from the parish council. And you look at it and you say that before you start building, please ensure that if there are any restrictive covenants on your title, that you go to the court and you have them amended, discharged, or modified. What exactly does your building approval mean? It means, therefore, that you have to go to the court. You have to secure the services of a lawyer to make an application by fixed date claim form to the Supreme Court and giving evidence as to why it would be justified for this particular covenant to be modified. If you were living in a place like Bonebrook, you can say, you know, this is a residential covenant. I want to build a restaurant on my land. And there are lots of other restaurants in Bonebrook. There is a radio station in Bonebrook. There are various businesses in Bonebrook. So in the circumstances, it would not be against the character of the neighborhood for me to get a restaurant. And it is good for you to secure the services of an attorney, right? If you're going to be making an application for the modification or discharge of the covenant, because your building approval, if it is conditional, it is useless until and unless the court has modified the covenants. You go through the Supreme Court and you modify the covenants. Now, there's another issue that the, the listener just asked um, that I had made a note of as well. Should the parish councils across the island change policy regarding conditional approvals? This is something that can be discussed you know, um, you can lobby, you know, with your elected representatives to see if, if this can be effected in our parish council so that they perhaps amend their policy in relation to the conditional approvals. Now, 
The next question is, should the parish council withhold approval until the amendment of restrictive covenants are resolved in the court? Some persons say that might be the better way. It would be better for the parish council not to grant the approval until the modification has been completed. The next question is, do developments have limits? This was part of the, the question that was canvassed at the, the town, town hall meeting in Kingston recently concerning the spate of developments that we have seen sp springing up all across the corporate area. And they do have limits. You know, um, there is such a thing called architectural integrity. You know, buildings can affect the mood of a place the mood, the culture of a place. You know, um, when you look at the, the beautiful multicolored buildings in the Netherlands or um, in the Netherlands or um, even in Curacao and, 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 and these particular places, you know, architecture can really contribute to the culture of, 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 of the place and what people are known for, what the place is known for. And developments have to have limits. You know, developments have to have limits. It has to be done responsibly. One of the, the, the concerns that was raised even in the town hall meeting in Kingston recently was the, the fact that Kingston perhaps needed some more green spaces. That, you know, it, it shouldn't just be a concrete jungle, but, you know, there should be trees and plants. You know, plants um, contribute to oxygen. You know, so there, there, there should be a limit. Um, and there should be a balance for the, the need of development and the need to reflect the needs of the people. Now, on a more positive note, this ruling has breathed new life into a floundering justice system where the perception has been that justice has less to do with the protection of citizens' rights and more to do with influence and the ability to afford, you know, high-priced lawyers and, and things of that nature. But here we have it that Mr. Lin, you know, was an established businessman, a, a man of means, but the court decided against him. So this does show that, you know, justice is available in Jamaica. Um, and um, it is also interesting to note that this was a case where a, a class action was filed, which means that a group of people, you know, they're, they say that there is strength in numbers. So a group of neighbors said, uh-uh, we don't want our neighborhood to just change so drastically for this because, you know, it's like a domino effect. Mr. Lynn comes in now with his development and very soon we're going to see all these high rises all over our community and we don't want the character of our neighborhood to change so they did what was called a class action so sometimes you as a lone person you might have a concern but if you are able to gain the support and the assistance of your neighbors then you can have a joint suit as Miss um, Jen Shear did in this particular case with herself, her husband, and five of her other neighbors, and they were successful. Now, another issue that came out of the case was the fact that maybe developers need to take a, a step back in terms of their perception that they can just do as they please. They're just so arrogant, as, as that's what the judge thought of Mr. Lin in this particular case, in floating existing ordinances and covenants, you know, governing construction and commercial activities, particularly in residential areas. And sometimes people feel like they don't have a say. You know, you think that the rich man, where him say go, what his word is final. But the, the, the community members in that particular case said no. And you realize how strident they were. They never gave up. Even when he was building and the building was finished, they were still fighting, you know. So perhaps this will be a wake-up call for developers that some people actually mean business when they, they oppose these things on actual lawful grounds, you know, that, you know, their, their investments and, you know, their capital input in these um construction developments might might be lost so you know they they really should exercise more caution now um indeed the the the, the, the developer had said that um 
unapproved variations to existing building permits from the KCC are quite commonplace. So what he was saying is that this is this happened all the time. This I know this is not anything new. This happened all the time that things aren't approved by the KCC and the buildings go up and there are no consequences to it. And that is a general perception of quite a number of our citizenry in this country that people are allowed to float, you know, regulations to do as they please. But um you know, the court decided um, rightly, um, I think, in this particular matter, and it remains to be seen what will happen in the coming months, whether Mr. Lin will take this one like a man or whether he will appeal the judgment. And just like that, an hour has passed and we're at the end of our show. It was a pleasure being with you. I hope that you learned something. I hope that you enjoyed being with me. I really appreciate Karen tuning in and the various other listeners who didn't give a name, but I still appreciate you tuning in. And next week at four o'clock, same time, I will be here. If you have a particular topic that you'd like to talk about, you can write it in. You can um, call or WhatsApp or number 876-453-1444. Or or a local number, nine or international number rather, nine five four three three eight seven nine seven three. Thank you for joining me. It was a pleasure. And all things being equal, join me next week for all things legal. Join your host Janine Lang on Styles FM this and every Friday from four p.m. to five p.m. for 